Today I'm gonna to cover variables and expressions. So you've seen some variables, how you input variables, how you print variables, what an integer is, what a string is, things like that. However, today what we're gonna cover is more on what we can do with them. So for example, I've got my REPL.IT pulled up here. And essentially what we're gonna cover are a couple of operators that we didn't cover before. One is the module operator. And another one is going to be all the different data types that we have. For example, a list, a set, a tuple, and how we can actually act upon those. And so what I would like you to do is actually go to a different REPL. So the REPL that we're going to go to today is a slightly older version of Python, but it's Python with Turtle. So this allows us to graphically see the results that we're going to do. So So essentially those two lines always have to be in there. That's how we grab another turtle. And then we can actually use T as an object to use the turtle. So what I'm gonna to cover today is we have both the results, which is the canvas that the turtle will be printed on, and then the console where we can see the original values that we have. So let's take a look at one data type that we have first is the integer. And what we can do with this. So one operator is called the module operator. It looks like this. It's a percent sign. And essentially what it is, is if you think about division with integer division, you are given two uh, values after division. You're given the quotient as well as the remainder. The quotient is given to you by the double forward slash or the single forward slash. And then the remainder is given to you if you use the percent sign. So for example, if I divide 100 by 20, that's five with a remainder of zero. So if we look at this, we get a remainder of zero. So let's take this and make it 21. So now we have a remainder of 16. So let's do something a little bit different. So 10 divided by two, the remainder is zero. 10 divided by three, the remainder is one. So if you think about it, 10 divided by three is three. So that's nine, three times three is nine, minus 10 gives you one. And so that is essentially what the module operator does for you. Now, one of the things that the Zybooks has in there is essentially the module operator is used to give you a range. So I'm gonna import another module called random. So random allows us to get a random number. So let's take a look at it. As you can see, there's a rand int. That's the one we're looking for. Rand int is the random number generator. And we can just do random.rand int, and we'll give it a range of 0 to 50 or something like that. Okay? And it gave us 0 for that one, 25 for that one, 42. So it's working. So we have to give rand int a beginning range and ending range, otherwise it won't work. So let's do this real quick. Let's essentially be the range. We're gonna give it a large range, and then we'll see what we can do with it. So as you notice, this is printing out a very large value. So what we wanna do is we wanna mathematically squeeze this into a minimum value and a maximum value. So we'll say the min val is 100, and then the max val is 105, or something like that. And so what we wanna do is we wanna use a specialized formula that allows us to squeeze this integer k in between 100 and 105. Now the formula looks like this. Okay, right. so essentially what we're going to do is the module operator has the exact same precedence as the division operator because it is division. It's, it's just going to return us the remainder instead of the quotient. So let's take a look at what this formula actually does. So in the denominator here, we have max val minus the min val plus one. The reason is, is because what is the range of values if I say k mod five? Well, we can get the value zero, one, two, three, and four because five divided by five has a remainder of zero. 0 divided by 5 has a remainder of 0. 1 divided by 5 has a remainder of 1. And so the range, you have five total numbers, but the range of those numbers is 0 through 5 minus 1. And so that is why we're adding this 1 right here. We're adding back that 1 so that we have a window that is exactly the size of k. So that's the number of numbers that I want inside there. And then the reason we add minval back in is because that will give us a number between 0 and the number of numbers between them. So if this case, if we take max val, which is 105, subtract off of it 100, we get the value five. If we add one to that, we get six. Well, the range of values we can get with that is zero, one, two, three, four, and five. Well, if we add min val into it, we add 100. 
And so the values we can get is 100, 101, 102, 103, 104, and 105. Because there's six total numbers in between there. 100, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. That's six total numbers. So let's take a look at what happens whenever we use this formula. So whenever we, I'm just going to leave off the plus min val for now. Notice we get a value between 0 and 4. I'm sorry, in this case, 0 and 5. If we add back on the min val, now I have 105, 102, 100, 100, 100, 102, 102. By the way, these go off of seconds, so that changes every second. There we go. And so, as you notice, it's giving us a value between 100 and 105. So this is the formula. It's the only formula you'll need to know, but it only works on integers. You cannot use the modulo operator whenever you're float. So let's take a look at what that does. Okay, so what this essentially does is it makes 1.0 an integer, 2.0 an integer, and even though they're floats, you don't really get a valid, so let's do something like this. There we go. So as you can see, essentially what you're doing is you're getting the remainder, but it's not quite the remainder that you expect. There is no such thing as a 0.2 remainder after integer division. And so what this is doing is it's giving you the remainder after division, however, if I do something like 2.0, we get 1.2, something like that. So the floating point is slightly different operating than a integer. In fact, in most um, programming languages, you can't use a mod operator on floating point numbers. So the mod operator is the module. It gives you the remainder after division. So let's take a look at other data types that we have available to us. So one of those is a list. A list is specified by using square brackets, and I have to specify something in there. So this is an empty list. So you'll notice it prints out an empty list. And if we print out the type of this, you'll see that it is of data type list. And so what we're going to do now is a list is resizable. We can add any kind of heterogeneous elements that we want. So we can have integers mixed with floats, mixed with whatever, and it's ordered. So if I put in here 10, 20, 30.0, and then hello, 10 is gonna come before 20, before 30, before hello. So now whenever we do this, it's still of type list, but now you can see we actually have elements populated inside of it. Now, sometimes it's helpful to actually look inside of this. So we use square brackets to actually expand or extract a certain element from there. So notice when I say A, this is called the subscript operator. The square brackets are known as the subscript operator. And we give it an index value between zero and the length of the list minus one. So if you think about it, a computer always counts from zero. So element zero is 10, element one is 20, element two is 30.0, and element three is hello. And so if I try to do four, that exceeds the bounds, we're going to get what is known as an index error. It's gonna say, hey, uh, this doesn't exist. If we wanna print the length of a list, we can use the len function, it stands for length. Whenever we do that, we can see we have four total elements. So beginning is always zero, ending is always length, minus one. So let's do something like this. Let's print a ending. Okay, notice we have the length is four and it prints out hello. That is the last element that we have. So this is one of the things that most students have trouble with at first is to see what is the index or indices that I have available to me. Well, if I have four elements, that's zero, one, two, and three. That gives us four speci uh, specific elements that we can use. Zero is always the first one. Length minus one is always the last one. So notice if I print a sub two, we're, we should get 30.0. If I print a sub one, we get 20. Now to show you we can use a heterogeneous data type, if I type a sub one that gives us an integer, a sub two gives us a float, a sub three gives us a string. So a list can have lists in it if we wanted to. So let's go ahead and put in another list. So now a sub three won't exist, right? Because we have three elements. We have 10, 20, and then a list. So notice it's not in there. So if we did two, that gives us the list 30 and hello. Now, how do you think we're going to actually extract out? So let me do a sub two. Notice it gives us the entire list. Now this list has two elements, so zero and one. So what I do is I do another square brackets and this will print out hello. So what we're doing is we're subscripting. We're actually looking into the list and we're grabbing the certain element. So in this case, we're, it starts from left to right. So we look in the list A for element number two, which is the, sec, the in 
the nested list that we have inside of here. When we get to that list, we extract that out, and then we look for the first element in that list. Well, remember, the first element, number one, is actually the second element because we start counting at zero. So zero is 30.0, and one is hello. So that's why this prints out hello. Now, a list can grow. We can also modify elements inside of there. So for example, if I said a sub zero equals a sub one plus two, what that's going to do is remember everything on the right hand side of equal sign is evaluated first. So it looks at a sub one. A sub one is the value 20. So it substitutes that here and adds two to it. So that's 22 and then stores that result into a sub zero. So 10 is overwritten by the value 22. And you can see we get the value 22. Now this has three elements in it. We can actually grow a, a, a list by using the append function. So it's a dot or whatever the variable name is dot append and we put in parentheses what we want to append it with. Let's print a string called goodbye. Notice it actually extends the list by one. So now it adds an element to it. Now the, le the length of this list is now going to be four. We now have indices zero, one, two, and three. If I want goodbye, I could do it two ways, length of A minus one, or I can just do zero, one, two, and then three, so it'd be three. So as you can see, this gives us goodbye. So a pen does that, it allows us to determine where we want to put things inside the list. Now, what if I wanna remove an element? The syntax is slightly different. Say we wanna remove the 20. Now, if we have to know its index, so we know this is zero, this is one, this is two. So if I wanna remove the 20, I use del, stands for delete, and I do a sub one. So now what's going to happen is I'm gonna print out a and notice that the 10 is gone. Del deletes it completely. Now, if we wanna delete the entire list, I say del a, but on line 10, I'm using print, which no longer exists because I deleted the entire list. So del a, del, delete can be used to delete the entire list or certain elements inside of the list. So one of the things we can do, if we want to delete something based on its value instead of its key, zero, one, two, three, or its index, say we wanted to delete goodbye. So I'm gonna print it here and then delete it by saying a.remove. What that's going to do is instead of deleting it by its position, it's actually going to search through the entire list, find a value that says goodbye, and then try to remove it. Notice when we do that, goodbye is removed. Now let's try to remove something that doesn't exist like good. Notice it's going to give us a value error. It's gonna say, hey, X, which is in this case good, does not exist in this list. And so you have to make sure that that value exists. To, if we wanna see if a value exists inside the list, we can use the in keyword, I-N. So we're gonna say um, goodbye in A. So what that's going to do is it's gonna to test to see whether the value goodbye is in the list A. If it is, it'll return true. If it's not, it'll return false. Now you'll see what this matters whenever you get into conditional statements because we can conditionally execute, we can do a.remove after we've done the membership test. So this is what's called the membership test right here. We're trying to see if good exists in A, okay? So let's see if 10 exists in A. It doesn't because remember, this 10 got overwritten on line six. So let's see if 22 exists in A. Yes, it does. And so in, so it goes value you're searching for in and then the list that you're searching into. And it will either return you a true or false. A true or false, notice the capital T, capital F for false, uh, is a Boolean data type. I've overwritten A, so the list is now gone and it's false. This is what's known as bool stands for Boolean. Boolean has two values, true, false, yes or no. It's a bimodal type of variable. It can only store in Python, true, notice it's capital T, or false, capital F, okay? And when I print this, it will have the value true or false. Okay, in this case, true because line nine set it equal to true. If I got rid of line nine, it gives us false. We can also, do a couple things onto these lists. We can append them to each other. So let's create a list of integers like this. Let's create another list, uh, 100, 200, 300, 400, something like that. Now what I can do is if I did A plus B, notice it gives us one big list. It actually puts all the elements of B into A and then gives us that, okay? Now notice after I'm done with that, 
A has not changed and B has not changed. Okay, so A plus B actually gives us a different list. And so if I wanted to, I can do something like C equals A plus B. When I do that, no, do that, notice what we do is we create a brand new list with all the elements. Notice it's in order as well. So if I did C sub three, notice we get the value 40. Okay, so that's zero, one, two, three, that's 40, four, five, six, seven. So if I wanted 400, it'd be C sub seven, and that gives us 400 at the bottom. There's also other functions that we can do upon a list. So we can do min, which stands for minimum, and so that will return to us the minimum value inside of C. So let's go ahead and print C. You can see if we look at this, this is monotonically increasing and 10 is the minimum value. So that's going to return 10. There's also max. Max returns you the biggest value. Now these only work upon integers or uh, numbers. So floating points and things like that. If you try to do this with strings, it's not going to work. Uh, there's also another thing we can do. We can actually use a sum. And what that does is it adds all the integers together and gives us the result. So these are just helper functions. You'll see whenever we get into loops and functions how we can actually do this ourselves. We don't need a sum function. It's just there for convenience. Another thing we can do is, uh, I think I've already shown you this, but check the length of C. So now we have eight elements inside here. Four from A, four from B. Give us one big list with now eight elements. Now another thing we can do upon this is, let's see, a dot append B, okay? Well, let's say uh, print A here. Now, what this is going to do is it's gonna grow the list of A by one element and then nest B inside of it. Notice how this is different than this. So if I use the append keyword, it actually puts the entire list inside of it. So this is what is known as a nested list. It's a list inside of a list. If I use the plus operator, it actually extracts out each individual element and creates a new list. It doesn't nest the list. Tuples are a way that we can store read-only data and fixed size data. So a list takes up a lot of memory as well as a lot of CPU, computer uh, central processing in, in your computer, because it has to be able to grow the list, shrink the list, add, subtract, multiply, divide, that sort of stuff, everything to a list. We can also have what is known as a tuple. A tuple uses parentheses instead of the square brackets that a list does, but essentially stores the same thing. Now we have a, which is a tuple of 10, 20, 30, 40. If I want a certain element in there, I do it the exact same way, a sub zero. However, what I cannot do is something like this. A tuple is read only, it cannot be assigned. You can, so I don't have a dot append. Doesn't exist. And so with a list, a list gives you a lot more flexibility. However, it takes up more CPU. It requires more processing power to actually process a list. Why? Well, because a tuple, it knows it's not, not going to grow. It knows it's not going to shrink. It knows its values aren't going to change. The next element is what is known as a set. A set is unlike a tuple because it's unordered. Uh, so if I say something like this, so set uses the curly braces, one, two, three, four. So because it's unordered, a sub zero means nothing. In fact, it's not going to work. So it says, hey, I don't know what that is. Now what we can do with a set is it's very quick to actually see if a member exists in there. We say one in a, that gives us the value true. That's because what we're doing is we're testing to see whether this is in there. So if I had a list, uh, a set of names or something like that, and I wanted to see if my name was in there, I can just say my name in A, and it is a very quick lookup. With a list or a tuple, we have to start at the very first element and keep searching to see whether I'm in there because it's ordered. A set is unordered, but it knows by its value where it's located. Now, once again, I can't have a set with two uh, values. So what this is, this is actually a set of three values. A set, if I write one into A again, it's going to overwrite the previous one that was in there. So a set can only have one key or one value as well. It's unordered and that's essentially it. It's a very quick way that we can establish what's inside of a set, things like that. So a set is interesting because a set actually has a certain mathematical functions that you're used to with a set, such as intersection, union, and things like that. So let's take a look at a set like this. Okay, 
So whenever I print this out, notice we get one, three, and four. So A, union B, did not actually add it to it. So let's say C equals A union B. When I do that, notice I have one, one, three, four, but it gives us one, two, three, four, and six. Notice there's only one, one inside the set. Now this looks ordered because it essentially is, we put it in order, but it not necessarily is going to be in that order. So A union B is exactly like it is in the mathematical sense. It takes one set, adds its elements into the other one. So notice A dot union B did not change the original A. I actually had to set it into a variable such as C, okay? Now intersection does the same thing. So let's say A dot intersection, and let's say A, I'm sorry, B. Notice the only thing that is occurring between these two sets is four. Everything else is unique to that individual set. So these work as mathematically. So the other ones we have is difference, and it'll tell what the difference is between the two sets and symmetric difference as well. So those are the mathematical functions that we can part, uh, act upon these two sets here. The next data type we're gonna see is what is known as a dictionary. Now a dictionary can be easily confused with a set because it uses the same curly braces. However, a dictionary is different than a set in that it still is unordered, but now instead of positionally awareing ourselves, we use what is known as a key. We'll just say D, and then we have a key and a value. So the key looks like this. Okay, now if we wanna look up what the, the value is, we search for it by its key, okay? Notice it gives us value, let's say hello, okay? So by subscripting the key, it gives us the value, okay? And so we don't do anything like D sub zero because that's not a valid key. So instead of indexing into a dictionary like we did a list, we search for a value by its key. Now this is great because if we have something like name, Something like that. Now we can look up, has to be a string, otherwise it thinks age is a variable. There we go. So what it's going to do is it associates Steve with name and associates 37 with age. So for example, if I want to figure out what the age of this person is, I can look them up by age and it gives me the value 37. So notice the key can be a string, the value can be a string, the key can be uh, any kind of data type that we want. Let's say it's 700. And it'll give us so notice my key in this case is an integer. The key in these cases are strings. And so we can use the key to look things up uh, anyway. So that is the great way we can actually look at what these are. Now, if I want to print out all the values without the keys, it creates me a list by doing d.values. This will give me a list of all the values that are in there. So from a dictionary, I can extract out a list by using dot values. Okay, so if I want the very first value, I do sub zero, sub one, gives me the second value. However, remember, these are not necessarily ordered. Because of that, you cannot assume that your list is in the same order that you expect it to be in. Now we can add things to a dictionary and we can subtract things from a dictionary. So just like on a list, we can delete a key by saying D sub name. So in this case, we have name, age, and 700. Those are our three keys. If we delete name, notice that's no longer a key. Its value is also gone. So the only two things we have left are age and 700. That's because I deleted them. Same thing with a list. If I do delete D, that deletes the entire dictionary and it is no longer, as you can see here, it's no longer a valid variable. Now, if what I want to do is update the dictionary. So it's not read only like a set or, or I'm sorry, like a, uh, a tuple. Now I can say name is John and notice it overwrites Steve to John. So let's print out the original dictionary. It was Steve, but I reset it to John, okay? Now if I wanna add a new entry, I don't have to use a pen or anything like that. I just give it a new key. Let's say 100,000 equals 700. When I do that, notice it automatically adds that key. Unlike a list, that's why a list has append because it knows it's ordered. It's specifying you know exactly where it's going to go. It's going to be appended at the back of a list. With a dictionary, since it's unordered, in this case, it's just gonna say, okay, I'm just gonna create a new key, set it equal to 700. So notice by just setting it equal to that, it creates a new key. If the key already exists, it's gonna overwrite it or update it. If the key doesn't exist, it's going to create it. 
and notice I can delete it just like we've done before. So dictionaries are extremely powerful and a lot of the things that you're gonna be doing in this class use dictionaries. The math module is very powerful in that it provides you a lot of utilities you can use mathematically to uh, get the floor, the ceiling, the factorial, uh, mod, x, the, the value of e, things like that, pi. There's a lot of things we can use with the math library. So somebody already wrote these for us, so we do import math, and now we have all these available to us. So for example, if I wanna get the value of pi, I just do math.pi, and it gives me the value of pi. So if I want to know what, um, let's say the sine of 180 is, it'll give me the sine of 180. So these are very, uh, so sign and things like that don't automatically exist. They exist within the math library. So you have to import the math library if you want to be able to use the sine, the cosine, ceiling, things like that. So let's take a look at what ceiling does. So if we do 18.6, it's 19. 18.3 is 19. 18.1 is 19. 18.0 is 18. So if there's anything above, so what it is it's going to do is it'll round to the near, uh, it'll round to the next integer. There we go. So it'll round to the next integer. So in this case, the next integer is still 18 because you have 0, 0.0 at the end. So essentially, if it's 0 0.1 or above, it's going to round to the next integer. So in this case, 18.1 will give me 19. The opposite of that is the floor. This is essentially, you've used this before because this is what the double slash division essentially does. So 18.1 goes to 18, 18.9 as well goes to 18. 